Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to all of you in this room, as well as welcome to those who are with us online. Um, and thank you for joining us for this session in ANH Academy Week. So this session will take the form of a panel discussion on the right to food and nutrition for children. But before we start engaging in our discussions, uh, we are grateful that we are graced with the presence of two of our sisters, Yamoria, who is here with us today, poets, and as was said earlier, um, unapologetic in their views, their words, and they inspired us so much. And so I'd like to ask them to come and open our discussion this afternoon. Hi. It's us again. <laughs> Just to make sure the energy is still alive. Dumelang, Ahe, Sanbonani, Saubona, Molueni, Molo, Kuyamara. Kuyamara. So the poem we're going to recite for you now is titled The Eleventh Plague. And for us, the eleventh plague is poverty. I mean, it's been around, it's still around, and it's been hovering over us, you know, since man, since before we can even have documents, you know, of these times, you know. And um, fun fact, uh, the poem has some of the, the plagues, the 10 plagues from the Bible. So we'll see how many of them you can just catch in there. And it's written in past tense because it speaks to villages that have formed and villages that have flattened due to po poverty, you know. So many uh, stories are lost in these villages. So many lives are lost, you know. And... Yeah, we wanted to capture that in this poem, and I think it speaks to some of the topics we've heard being raised today. All right. The sky littered blood into deprived gardens. Lilac sprouted thoughts into the back of my mind. Where memories of beef had long faded. I found frogs in the soles of my wrecked shoes. Walked through hunger storms and still the cabbage never bloomed. Children splattered hunger into their mother's laps. Gutter spilled happiness into their throats and they drank, drowning their lungs in stolen destiny. See, God didn't travel that far. Only angels who carried the final plague in their wings. This one took their mothers, their fathers, firstborn sons, secondborn daughters, thirdborn stillborns in this village. Lambs were a mystical creature and God was only a story rehearsed over supper where empty plates stayed back and starved loci were served for dinner. Nourishment was a synonym for impractical or unimaginable and food was a, use, a word used by false prophets. Hunger, a daily mantra recited in tomes lined in three sheets of darkness. Flesh too dry to let down tears in fear that the next raindrop would be the last. Seeping from their stretched paws, afraid that bones would begin to show. Exposing the suffering written beneath their eyelids. The sky littered into deprived gardens. Lilac sprouted thoughts into the back of my mind. Where, where memories, memories of an ancient village have, have now, now formed. formed. Thank you so much. Um, We just wanted to thank you for having us here today. And I think these sessions are so important. We believe that poets are the documenters of time. And uh, like they say, if you don't document your stories, uh, they will kill you and say you enjoyed it. So thank you so much for the space. And it's so beautiful to see art engaging with academics in this way and that we can still tell our stories in yeah. multiple different ways. So thank you for having us. Thank you so much. And I almost feel that and perhaps the next time we have such that we should have, you know, just five or few minutes just to let those words sink in and touch base um, because it painted a picture of the reality of life for so many people in our own country, but of course also in other parts of the world. So thank you so much for, for bringing and making that picture real. Uh, through means of words. Thank you. And so we, we continue now with our panel discussion where we will be focusing on, as I've said before, the right 
to food and nutrition for children in South Africa. We will also be looking at the interplay between different duty bearers who are responsible for the realization of the right of the child to food and nutrition. This is especially important in our current context where we are seeing uh, a high and escalating food price inflation. Just an example, for instance, uh, uh, according to the Household Affordability Index, it costs 813 Rand to feed a child a nutritious meal for a month. And our child support grant is at 460, which is 23% below the food poverty line and 41% below the, the cost to feed a child uh, a nutritious diet. So that's the reality. On our panel, we have four very distinguished persons, three of us in the room and one online, who each work towards the realization of the rights to sufficient nutrition, adequate nutrition for children. Dr. Chantelle Witten, who is Senior Lecturer and Project Lead for the Infant and Young Child Feeding Advocacy Project based at the University of the Western Cape. Dr. Witten is a dietitian by profession and a child rights activist by passion. And she will now speak to us around the violence of malnutrition and on building a child-centered food system in South Africa. So good evening, colleagues and friends in the food and nutrition fraternity. And thank you to our poets who touch us deeply with your words, because we know that food and nutrition is art and science. And so when I was invited to do this um, input, I think it was called a provocation, um, Scott asked me to be provocative. And as I was talking to colleagues about this presentation, I said, Chantal, if you're going to poke the bear, you either have to run or you have to fight. I said that we've been in a struggle and food and nutrition has been a struggle for a long time. So I want to tell you a story about nutrition in South Africa. And so I've called this the triple burden, which I will come to in terms of nutrition. But the triple burden I want to talk about are those fat reports, the thin and deficient responses, the increased hunger and the human losses that are happening every day. And so I also want to ask us to bow our heads just for a moment to think about those 22 children that died in the Eastern Cape. They interviewed a 16 year old and asked her, why were there so many people at the hangout? Her response was, they were giving free food and drink. We concentrated on the drink. There's lots of conversation about the drink, but nobody wants to talk about the hunger that plagues households. Kids hang out where there is food. And so I want to declare, firstly, I have no conflict of interest um, presenting here, except for my travel and accommodation. I've received no other incentive to participate. And I think it's important for us as academics that work in this space to know who's funding us, who holds the purse strings, and who holds our thoughts. And I would like to ask this conference at every conference that we have declarations of interest, conflict of interest, and conflicted interest. My interest is only about child feeding, and so my presentation today is particularly around the infant and young child feeding, and I'm going to use it as a case study as well. So my outline, I'm just going to have four um, inputs. I want to look at those fat reports. What have they been telling us and what have they generated over time? What are, why are the responses thin and deficient? We had inputs from advocate Tuli Mandonsala, professor from University of Stellenbosch, and her um, articulations about food and nutrition, the markets, who should be the disruptors? Who are we disrupting? And when are we going to disrupt hunger in South Africa? And then who's championing the children's right to basic nutrition? Because as you know, it is in the constitution, but as you know, those fat reports are going to tell us that hunger and malnutrition has been with us since the dawn of time. 
And then finally, we need to action now because children's lives can't wait. They can't wait for agendas and they can't wait for us to get our act together. While we sit in boardrooms and we sit in presentations like these, children are hungry right now. So let's talk about these reports. And I thought, let me not poke the bear too much. I'm going to just pull out a few reports that I have been part of. So back in 2001, I was a data collector and we were collecting data from the Eastern Cape. And this is built on work of the late Professor David Saunders. People forget that the child support grant was built on malnutrition in the Mount Frey area. At that time, Professor, the late Professor David Saunders actually called the Minister of Social Development at the time, Dr. Zola Squeia, to say, do you know why the children are constantly coming in at the house hospital and then being discharged back to households? It's because there's no food in the cupboards. And unless we're going to help the Gokos who are looking after most of these children, we won't be able to fix malnutrition in South Africa. And the roots of the child support grant is in child hunger and malnutrition. And then I found this document, which I hadn't even thought about. It's, it is tabled under the resources for the African Development Bank. And I see that Professor Scott Remy and I had met back then in 2008 when this was an input to the then becomes the roadmap for nutrition in South Africa. It was a policy analysis. And it was talking about what are the gaps in, the, in that time, the current setting for child malnutrition in South Africa. So we are talking about... Um, more than, I guess, 12 years now, um, already understanding what were the gaps. Then we did a WHO landscape analysis. In 2010, we collected data specifically for programs for children under five, and the recommendations were exactly as the report put out in 2008, and I will pull out some of those recommendations. And then a publication that I think South Africa must be really, really proud of is the Food and Nutrition Security um, child gauge that came out last year, which was at the height of the COVID pandemic. And this publication called on 60 experts in the food, in the field of food um, security, food environment, food security, and nutrition. And so I like the low, the, the name agriculture, nutrition, health, because it's the nexus. And that nexus comes together in a plate in front of a child. And this publication pulls all of that data, the most recent data you're going to find in this publication. And so for those that have were at the launch, I'm going to be using some of those slides to talk to some of the gaps that we're still, um, I, um, still experiencing right now. So this is a policy analysis of the policy environment in South Africa. I've put it together with the timeline of when we actually knew South Africa had a problem. In 1994, the then ruling party put together an integrated nutrition program, which was the foundation with a head of nutrition. At that time, the head of nutrition was Nobuyeni Tladla. She was a social worker. And they called a meeting with all the heads of department at the time to put inputs into the integrated nutrition program. On the back of that, the UNICEF had just published a um, Let's call it best practices from the Rohingya, uh, Rohingya, from the Tanzanian study, where they saw what works, and all of that information was fed into the integrated nutrition program. So we have one of the most advanced integrated nutrition programs in policy. It builds on all the interventions that need to be implemented within a country to reduce hunger. At that time, in 1999, we already knew that stunting was one in um, one in five children, and it was at 21%. Then we had that roadmap that I said we had given inputs to. The roadmap came out in 2013. At that time, we had the 2012 SA in Haines study, and we saw that our stunting was at 24%. It was not statistically significantly different from the 21%, but it showed that there was it was going up. And then finally, in 2016, we had another survey, and that survey showed that stunting is now at 27%. There's a current survey running right now that we will look forward to the results by the end of this year. And we all know that the impact of COVID, the impact of job losses, the impact of food prices, do we expect stunting to have gone down? I don't think so. 
And why is stunting such an important element? We all use it, we all talk about it, we all quote the 27%. But what it actually means, ladies and gentlemen, is that children are losing brain capacity in terms of their development. Not only are they paying now by hunger and suffering and indignity, but they're never going to be able to develop to their full potential because brain size is actually compromised. Education ability is compromised. Future work opportunities is compromised. And premature morbidity and mortality is what they're looking for in the future. So this is not about whether you are too short or too thin. It's about your quality of life and whether you're going to be able to achieve in the future. This is one slide. And if for the students in the room, you can go back to the slide, but basically that triple um, burden of disease is the unabated stunting levels that are not going down, even after all of the inputs that South Africa has in the health system, in the social protection system, we are still not able to address stunting. We still have not been able to crack the first feeding. And the first feeding is still breastfeeding. You cannot fix any of the nutritional profile issues that we are talking about unless we tackle breastfeeding. And South Africa has the lowest breastfeeding rates on the African continent and one of the lowest breastfeeding rates in the middle income countries. Until we all can talk around the breastfeeding agenda as a community, we are not going to be able to address the stunting nor the increasing in um, non-communicable diseases. Then, as you will heard from Mervyn, as long as food prices is unaffordable, people can't eat a nutritious diet. And therefore, our dietary diversity is low, and we also have low minimum, what we call the minimum adequate diet. That means the quality of the food and the frequency of food or feeding of children is compromised. And then finally, all of our studies have shown that obesity was increasing. We could see the steady rise of obesity. And right now, we are three times higher than the global prevalence. And if we don't do anything with the highly processed foods that are still part of the package that the poorest people buy, as long as we are there buying flour, oil, sugar, making magunias so that children can eat three times a day, we're not going to address obesity or diabetes in South Africa. And as long as we don't have a child surveillance system, we're not going to be able to have tailored data, in, um, data informed interventions. I want to look at this slide because we always look to Brazil and we've seen how Brazil has done wonderful changes in terms of their stunting. Over the same time, South Africa has not been able to change that needle on stunting. And the reason why this is, is the following, is that at every point of contact that we know, a pregnant woman who is malnourished is going to have poor birth outcomes when she delivers her baby. Her baby is going to either be low birth weight, her baby is going to be premature, and that child has got predispositions then that feed into the stunting. So that's where we always are pegging is stunting, but already we know that it's starting long before stunting. And then as we as we've indicated in the health system, we are doing as much as we can, but Food and nutrition is needed every day. And that's why it's a social justice issue. It is not a medical manifestation. It's a failure on the system and it's a failure right at the household level. So this is what I was talking about in terms of understanding how nutrition is fueled. We see malnutrition, but what we know is it's inadequate food and it's a high level of disease. And we've been pegging all our interventions there. But the biggest issue that we are trying to address is the poverty issue. And the poverty issue is holding people trapped in, in hunger, in malnutrition, and it's got an intergenerational outcome. So a mom who is pregnant, her girl child's ovaries are already developed in utero. So the future of that child is already affected. So the overweight mom gives birth to a low birth weight baby who becomes the overweight child who then becomes the overweight adult. So you can see three generations are being affected. And this is on a physiological level that we can't change if we don't fix the young child. And so that's why early intervention is the only way we can change that. So I've listed a few things here that we say we are doing 
but we have limited and inadequate interventions. Pregnant women can't stay home. They have to go out looking for food because we don't have maternity protection in South Africa, paid maternity protection. The Tal Grant can't buy enough food for a mother and a child. We know that the early um, uh, the ECD, early childhood development, they do get subsidies, but the poorest of the poor don't qualify for the subsidies because they don't have all the infrastructure that then meet the criteria. So those that need it the most are left out. And the National School Nutrition Feeding Program comes in very late. And we've seen during COVID that it became a very um, impeditive source of food and nutrition when the schools were closed, when the school feeding program wasn't able to deliver. And so all of this inadequate and inferior interventions are thin on the ground. And that's why I've called them thin responses and they are deficient. This we can't answer unless we answer poverty. And we had that discussion earlier. So poverty is feeding our malnutrition rates. It's not about food quality because the poorest of the poor don't have food on the table. The poorest of the poor don't eat every day. And the poorest of the poor have inferior food. We know water is a problem. In Eastern Cape, I think Port Elizabeth was counting down to day zero because they weren't able to access water. We still need to be fighting for water rights. We still need to be fighting for adequate services that are at the household level because fuel prices to just cook. If you want a mom to cook for her child and the electricity and the paraffin is too expensive, what is she going to feed? Two minute noodles. Not because she's lazy, not because she doesn't want to cook. It's too expensive. And earlier, Mervyn asked, are we reaching that point where it's too expensive to go to work? And yes, Mervyn, we are at that point because we have friends that say they can't go to work in the last week of the month until they get paid because they just can't fill their car for a thousand rand a month. So that's where we are. And then we want to advocate, if we are going to change the food system, we got to put children at the center. We haven't quite unpacked what does that mean for South Africa to have a child-centered food system. But it is about looking at long term. How does each of the organizations that we are all linked to put children first? I often hear, and I was on a, on a seminar where we talked about food sovereignty. You can't fight for seeds if you can't fight for the breast. Because the most nutritious food for children still stays breastfeeding. And as long as we let industry undermine the breastfeeding agenda, we can't fight for equity in a food system that is benefiting and profiteering on hunger. And so this slide has to be unpacked at some point, and I'm challenging um, Scott to give us another opportunity where we can come back and say, what does it mean to have a child-centered um, food system? So what I'd like to, to advocate here as I close is that one, malnutrition starts in the womb. So we are positioning children with their mothers. We're no longer talking about mothers on one side and children on the other side. It's mothers and children because they're the, the, the dyad. That's a health term. All it means is you can't have fruit without a branch. How are you going to have the fruit if you don't have the branch? So we have to put women in the middle of that um, discussion. I want to say that we still need to talk about family planning. I find that we are talking more and more about food as if food is just on a shelf. It's not. The biggest impact if you can have for mothers is if you can have good birth spacing. I would yet like to hear the food people talk about birth spacing. I also want to say maternity protection, both in pregnancy and in breastfeeding, are imperatives if we're going to fix malnutrition in, in any country. And those countries that have made changes like Brazil, like Rwanda, like Malaysia, started with the breastfeeding agenda. We are in a crisis, not only because of COVID, but because of the economic downturn. So we can't talk about households that are no income households, low income households, households waiting for the social relief grant of 350 Rand and think that they can eat well every day. We've got to have macro policy interventions. I know people don't like it. We have to disrupt the, the food system. We can't talk about this if you're not going to have our retailers put a food basket aside and say, these are no profit foods. Countries have done that. Countries have also been able to give out rice when there was a, a downturn in Indonesia, Bangladesh. They fixed the rice price. And you know what they found when they fixed the rice price? 
that women could buy fruits and vegetables for their children. Otherwise, they spend all their money just on rice. So the rice price paper taught us that if we can fix certain foods, prices, households will be able to cope. And then we cannot talk about in a place where you have unemployment up to 60% within locations without a universal basic income grant. Food is bought in South Africa. Not all households had food gardens. And even if you had a food garden, you couldn't eat all your nutrients from a food garden. You'd still have to buy food. So in closing, because we want to talk about food justice and we want to talk about the rights to food, the state has an immediate obligation to respect, protect, promote, and fulfill the child rights to basic food. And it says that even in economic crisis, the state may only introduce regressive measures, such as closing down the, the National Nutrition Program, as a last resort. And it must ensure that children are the last to be affected. We saw during COVID that children will be shielded by parents and mothers specifically, but still hunger increased. And we know that when we get the results at the end of the year of the survey, we're going to see that our malnutrition rates have increased because it is chronic malnutrition. And then the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has called on all states. That means all actors and the whole of society to activate immediate measures to ensure their children are fed nutritious food. We need to bring the retailers, the food producers into the conversation. We cannot talk about food justice without those who are also making the food and profiteering from the food and serving us bad food for the future because that's where the NCDs are lying. And we have the evidence. It's not like we are making these statements without evidence. And to end in poetry, because this is a poem, by um, Gabriela Mistral, many things need to, many things we need can wait. The child cannot. Now is the time his bones are formed, his mind developed. To him, we cannot say tomorrow. His name is today. Thanks, Mervyn. Thank you so much, Dr. Chantal Vitton, for such a provoking um sharing with us i mean tracing the the timeline around policy development how things have time has moved but nothing has actually been done uh around policies developed much much earlier and the centrality of the child in our discussion around food justice and in our discussions around the food system. Thank you. And I'm sure that some of the uh, what you had shared with us will be picked up again by some of the other presenters, as well as uh, uh, later on in the Q&A session. I would now ask us to listen to Professor Anna Marie Tho, who is with us online. Um, she works uh, and collaborates on research in Asia, Africa, and the Pacific region, designed particularly to strengthen nutrition policy making. And she will share with us some thoughts around governance of food systems for health in Africa. Thank you for joining us. And um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mervyn, and thank you for the invitation. I'm honoured to um, follow Chantel and have an opportunity to respond to that excellent provocation. Uh, I'm speaking today from um, the lands that are um, the lands of the Gadigal people in the Eora Nation uh, here in Sydney, Australia, and I'd like to pay my respects and acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. Um, and pay my respect to elders past, present and future and extend that respect to all Indigenous persons. Um, I'm inspired, Chantal, by your declaration of interests, And I would also like to um, acknowledge that I have received no funding to present. I think this is an important addition. And um, yeah, it's a privilege to be here today. In my response to Chantal's provocation, I would like to pick up on your, your comments, particularly about the macro policy and the food system. Um, I think 
you described really well the tensions, the progress and the remaining challenges in terms of policies, particularly in the health sector, in the social grants. Um, and I would like to focus on the need for affordable, healthy food which as you pointed out, requires engagement and transformation and disruption within the food system um, to complement the demand side intervention by ensuring that food is actually available. Um, and uh, what I'd like to highlight here is that if we do want to um, achieve food system disruption, we have to think and ask, why don't we like to talk about macro policy, as you so rightly said? And in order to understand that, we need to talk more about who governs the food system and why, and what drives the current food system policy making. I'd particularly like to highlight that when we as people interested and passionate about nutrition um, and uh, the, right, the right to food, come to think about and talk about the food system, we have to acknowledge that the decisions that, the policy that surrounds the food system that incentivizes the food system is made in economic sectors. It's made by departments of trade and industry, It's made by departments of agriculture, fisheries and finance. Um, and for these sectors, industry is the stakeholder. And I think all of our conversations about uh, conflicts of interest in a public health nutrition space are really critical um, and really essential. But when we come to the food system policy space, I think that they're often the concept of conflict of interest with respect to industry isn't well understood. Um, when I, in, as part of my research, I speak to policymakers in the economic sector primarily. And for them, as I said, industry is their stakeholder, they're mandated to engage with industry and to ensure um, that the policies that they make take into account the considerations and concerns of industry. Um, and what this has resulted in is food system policy, which responds first and foremost to industry concerns. And the research that I've had the opportunity to conduct with colleagues in South Africa, also paying, um, I guess, a debt of gratitude to the late Professor David Sanders, um, and also acknowledging the excellent work that um, Busiso Moyo has done as part of his PhD. Um, we have really found that the, in the food system sector um, of government and in terms of policymakers around food and nutrition, what we see is then a really um, powerful influence of industry. And from a political economy perspective, it's really clear that the industry is able to influence and shape food policy and particularly shape a lack of regulation in the food system uh, because of um, two key reasons and among others. The first is that industry taps into concerns, legitimate concerns by the government about economic growth and employment. Um, what this means is that um, in a neoliberal uh, policymaking context, industry argues very effectively for um, minimal intervention by the government and minimal regulation of the food system, which contributes to those outcomes that Chantel described so well in terms of a lack of access to food. Um, and I'd really like to point to the work of Tracy Ledger in South Africa in this space in terms of um, showing very clearly what the result of a reluctance of government to intervene in the food system has been in terms of outcomes. The second um, leverage point for industry is that they have successfully positioned themselves as a holder of technical knowledge um, and expertise regarding food. And so in food system policy making, um, there is this really strong sense that industry is the expert. Industry is um, the knowledge holder in terms of food and how to get food to people. And I would certainly um, acknowledge the incredible expertise of food industry actors in terms of supply chains. And I don't want to undermine that. But when we come to think about a food system that delivers for nutrition and delivers for children, 
we have to challenge some of these paradigms around who holds knowledge about a functional food system. Um, I'd also like to talk though a little bit about um, what gives me hope and to like spend the second half of my response on thinking not just about these political economy challenges and um, the fact that what we have at the moment globally is a food system that doesn't deliver for nutrition and is not child-centered and spend some time thinking about what it would look like, as Chantelle said, to revision and disrupt a food system. And to me, the primary reason that I remain optimistic about the potential for food system transformation is that I see globally, but also in South Africa over the past decade in particular, a growing recognition that the food system isn't achieving on any of its outcomes. There, um, I think there's a really strong sense that in fact, the food system's not delivering in terms of livelihoods, livelihoods for farmers, livelihoods for workers throughout the value chain. Um, the food system's also not delivering in terms of its environmental impact, which is unsustainable and devastating. And then of course, as Chantel so eloquently explained, the food system isn't delivering for the most vulnerable in society in terms of their nutrition and well-being. And I, to me, this recognition that it isn't just nutrition, that we as nutritionists are not asking for a perfectly functional food system to change, but we're actually pointing to yet another aspect of a dysfunctional food system and calling for reform that delivers on multiple fronts. And this, I think, um, provides um, an entry point and also a point of leverage, which I'll talk about a little bit more. In South Africa specifically, I think this recognition that the food system is failing to deliver is evident in the policy progress that we have seen. And although, as Chantelle pointed out, this is um, patchy and there's more needed to be done, um, policy like the National Planning Commission's um, taking the lead on the food and nutrition security strategy, um, the sugar sweetened beverage tax, the salt standards, I think in certain areas, um, the South African policy is leading the world. And that is something that's important to acknowledge and to be able to build upon. Um, and I'd like to really echo Chantelle's point that building on the progress that's been made, we won't achieve ch fundamental change in nutrition outcomes unless we're ask asking for food system change. Um, and to do that, one critical thing I think that's required is creation of effective platforms for engagement across sectors. And I would suggest that this needs to happen in the nutrition space, as well as in the multidisciplinary, poli multi-sectoral policy space. In the nutrition space, I was, I was really inspired, Chantelle, by your um, strong presentation of integrated and the integrated nature of the triple burden of malnutrition. And I think all too often globally, we see quite separate advocacy with respect to the right to food and food sovereignty, with respect to undernutrition and with respect to non-communicable diseases. And I think um, more and more consistent integration of our messaging around the fact that these are not separate problems. This is one issue of malnutrition is critical. Um, but I also think that we need platforms within government that enable different sectors to talk to each other. Um, we need platforms that would enable um, health, for example, to input into trade and investment agreements that safeguard health more effectively, um, that rethink competition law, which governs retail, um, that rethink agricultural policy that enable um, food system policy making to really reflect the fact that the food system is a system and not a bunch of separate sectors um, that don't talk to each other. Um, and the final thing that I wanted to highlight what is that I do see a lot of goodwill from the economic sector. And I would say above all, that also keeps me optimistic. Um, and 
this is really related to what I mentioned earlier in terms of this recognition that food systems aren't achieving. And what I'm finding as I talk to policymakers across trade and agriculture and finance and industry and fisheries is that there's a recognition and an, um, and an understanding of the importance of nutrition. I think the advantage that we have as people passionate about nutrition is that nutrition is personal as well as societal and it affects everybody on multiple levels. It's very immediate. Um, I would also suggest that one of the exciting developments recently has been the translation of that goodwill into um, some reframing and rethinking in the economic space. I think not least the World Bank's Human Capital Index, which has shifted the focus of what the economic sector does to think about human capital and really echoing Chantelle's explanation of that lifelong and um, significant impact that malnutrition has on people's, not just the physically, but also cognitively um, and socially. And so a reef, an economic sector reframe of why investing in children is critical from that human capital perspective points, I think, also to the value in um, engaging strategically with the champions for change within food system sectors because they are there. These, there are so many people working across the food system who are seeing a need for change and a championing, championing change within different aspects of the food system. And for us to be able to speak their language and to reach out to find shared agendas and to look for ways to um, push and disrupt the food system to shift policy in ways that help to deliver more um, holistically improved outcomes of a food system in terms of nutrition, in terms of livelihoods and in terms of environment, I think is um, one of the critical opportunities for shifting towards a child-centered food system. Uh, so I'll wrap up there, but thank you again uh, for the opportunity to respond. Thank you so much to uh, Professor Anna-Marie Tho for, for responding to the provocation in such a broad perspective and bringing together so many of the kind of political economy and governance questions. So our next speaker on the panel is Nzama Mbalati, uh, who, as many of us know, is the head of the Health Living Alliance and has many years of experience in community and health systems, starting from the way back from the TAC campaign, et cetera, building social movements uh, with the objective of the right to food, as well as NCD prevention. Uh, and he will, he will speak to us around some of the strategic advocacy and social movement imperatives. Okay, thank you so much, Chair. And I, I guess you, you're balancing the gender. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> um, which is so great. I think, I think this is great. Um, just to like reflect and energize um, about some of the, our challenges and, and how to overcome and resolve them. Because I think I have a problem when people get into complete despair whether it's electricity, whether it's like, like, oh, nothing works. And because I think it, it, things can demoralize and we have different ways of, you know, um, adapting to things that are difficult. But I think we, we still have to hold um, the torch, even when it's dark. Um, we have to find the light in the, in, the, in the midst of darkness. So I think particularly with young people here, because I think, I think the voices of young people, I think nutrition has been too old, too academic, too, and I'm not judging, right? It has lacked as we see so. I don't know if I'm young or old, maybe, <laughs> yeah, somewhere there, yeah, right? So maybe somewhere, but maybe, maybe, maybe not that young in terms of the definition of youth 
in the in the political parties. Yeah. But I think I think the, the voice of youth will be absolutely critical. So I think I think for us, the main issue, um, and then listening to the two great speakers and, and the connection um, on like what do we envisage as you know um child because now there's a school nutrition program but child was in the utero right child was in the ecd center probably if parents can afford other kids never get to um to take their kids because i think sometimes we talk a lot and and not like understand what communities need um and 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 it's not only done by academics and and sometimes i have a problem with going to take information from people without giving them anything back so you come including myself sometimes we come and collect data and then go and present it elsewhere and and there's nothing for that community like really so so you came and took and um and I think one of the journalists was sharing an experience just to be quick because I don't know what to say and what to leave out on when she was covering a story on hunger. Um, no, no, it was just conditions around, you know, um, some of the refuge camps for kids. And one of the things she did was to leave a camera with the kids to take the pictures of their surrounding and to take the picture of each other. That was a different story altogether. It didn't depict hunger in the way that, no, it, like, I mean, um, 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 those refuge camps in a way that it has been, it had hope. Other kids never had, had to use a camera. Other kids never saw a camera. As much as she went to take a story, to, to write a story, she gave something to those kids. She left smiles. She brought the pictures back to those children. And I think sometimes we have to be careful when we're taking from community and the community is really empty. What do we give back when we go and collect information, when we say, including ourselves, when we say we're going to consult with it and then write reports. Um, but I think our, our role is to really imagine and agitate as, as, as civil society and as advocates. Um, one of the things that treatment action campaign, for example, has done, it imagined what a treatment plan, an ideal treatment plan would look like. That meant like really drafting a treatment plan. Um, and I think we need, to, we, need to, we need to put back the conversation and understand that food is a very sensitive issue, right? It's, it's, it, it's, a, it's an issue that violates people's dignity. And, and in the way that we, we tell the story of who is hungry, and why there is a need for sensitivity and to understand cultural and social con constructs to food um, and lack thereof. Why, why if food, right to food, right to basic nutrition is an absolute right. It's one of the absolute right in the constitution. After so many years, even maybe let's also apartheid included because sometimes I had the conversation of 28 years of, or 30 years, like whoever was in power, why are we still having children that are hungry, um, dying of severe acute malnutrition and, and a stubborn, not changing standing as a result of nutrition. So I think, I, I don't think we have politicized food enough um, and I don't think we have built the collective power enough. Often we work in, sometimes it's caused by funding, you know, um, in, in separate streaming, streamline to push a certain uh, policy agenda. I think Sposito asked me a certain question I will not forget to date. He said, if the president was to come here, what would we all tell him? And I think it starts with defining what right to basic nutrition means for us, right? What does it mean? Like, when, what, are, what are the five things? Can we sing on the same mind book? I will talk industry. You will talk something. 
someone will tell something. So I think it's I think it's important that we build political power and proximate to the issue. And I think and I think one of the things that I think as as the movement we have we are struggling with now, including civil society and academia, is that we are so happy when we sit in spaces where, where government listen to us, whether we're presenting research, whether we are telling policymakers ourselves to say, you know, increase the health promotion level or whatever the case may be, we feel good. But I think the question that I, I've started to ask myself is, do they take us serious when they listen to us? Because I think right to food and hunger for children is a salient issue. It, for me, it's better than, it's not even better. It's a salient issue to pull protest. It's a sal salient issue to the extreme right and extreme left um, organizing of Afri Forum, of Operation Dudula. Why, why is our issue still not, still not a salient? Do we need to have sensitization with journalists? Have we spoken to our communities? Have we, have we brought the collective people power to the table? Is it me and Chantal talking about this issue? Do communities understand? Who do we represent? Um, nutrition has a, a lot of challenges with demogra demographics as well. And, and, and the realignment of that is critical. Who's talking about hunger? Is it someone who's privileged? Like I'm black, but to a certain extent I'm privileged. Like, probably lower middle class, because I, I could be middle class if I was not supporting my mother and my brother, and could, probably. So, so I would say lower, lower, lower rate of the middle class. So still privileged. So who is talking about this issue? Um, if, if, so we have to be, um, to be very critical of that. Okay, as I wrap up, I think collaboration is not, uh, not collaborating is not an option. Right, and I think spaces like this bring about that. And Hila, um, really, it's painful, but it can be done, and it's being done. It's bringing the coalition. Well, everyone, we must bring climate change people. We must bring environmental uh, people. We must bring health users like tech. We must bring churches. We must bring traditional leaders on on the team. We must bring young people and universities, and say we have a problem. And, and what are we going to do about it? And not talk over them, but work with them to organize and mobilize to build a, a, a just uh, food South Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zama, for reminding us yet again that we, we, we're not going to achieve anything if we cannot imagine, organize our political and collective power. Thank you. And so our final speaker is Yandiswa Mazwane, who is the founder of the Masipalela Creative Hub, uh, who does a lot of work at community level and is engaged with young people in particular. Uh, and so she'll speak with to us about some of her practical experience around food and, and nutrition and working with young people are the champions, as she calls them. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, uh, evening, everyone. Um, I don't know because Musiso has given me 15 or eight minutes, if I look correctly. And yes, eight, eight minutes and um, <laughs> asked me to share like, like 72 pages of a story. Uh, <laughs> um, um, the girls have uh, reminded me to continue when they did their point that I, I must continue telling, telling the story that uh, I'm sharing um, like worldwide. And um, <laughs> in the eight minutes, um, I'm sorry that I'm going to miss the fun parts of the story because uh, today I feel like the product of the malnutrition because that was the reason I came to Cape Town, was the fact that I'm seeing the children in my village going hungry. I wanted my homestead not to be in that serious stage. Then I decided to come in Cape Town in, in 1998. And um, I came with the hope 
that Cape Town has got everything yeah. that my community needs or I need um, in order to sustain back at home, coming from a very little town uh, called Tsomo. So when I arrived in, in Cape Town, I wanted to study further, but doing a very short course that will enable me to kind of get the job very quick so that I can tackle the issue that we're talking about today um, back at home. So I arrived in Fishhook and then went to Musenberg, which was the nearest college, and uh, confidently uh, um, kind of introduced and wanting to register myself under the free education registration, of which there was no such. And those two ladies laughed at me when I was saying that, like, where do you come from? There's no free education in South Africa. And that was right after the elections. It was 1998, it was four years or three years after the elections. And on the radio of my grandmother, it was said daily on the news that South Africa has got uh, a democracy and there's free education, they want to empower women, there's going to be this and that. And we were so excited. That is why I came to Cape Town, guys, because I came to that, you know, so that I'm very close to it. So um, the Musbeck uh, College said that there's, there's no such. And then I continued to being serious, telling them, and like trying to convince them that I know what I'm talking about. The radio cannot lie, especially my grandmother's <laughs> radio cannot. So, <laughs> exactly. Um, so um, they explained to me and then they have given me advice of what to do. They said, go and find a job, start a part-time. And the first job that I got was to clean coastal line of the South Peninsula. Um, I think the initiative was um, established by Vali Musa, who was the Minister of Environmental Affairs and Tourism, and we were cleaning up junk along the coastal line. I didn't like the job. It was cleaning up litter, and it has got a stigma of being crazy. So if you pick up things, dirty things on the road, you are a crazy lady. So I, I, I hidden the job. To, to my colleagues until um, the NGO was kind of like empowering us and then collecting some vocabulary, nice academic words of English um, until I find waste management. Then I got confidence of like writing to my girlfriends back at home and I'm like, girls, I've got the job. I'm doing waste management. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and the girls were like, yo, congratulations, Yandi. Oh, exactly. What, what, what gadget are you using? And I'm like, gadget. I'm using my hands and I've got gloves and I've got a big black bags in my bag. So I didn't respond back because now they want the gadgets, you know, and I don't have it. Um, to cut the story short, picking up litter has like open doors that I, I didn't think of. Um, plastic bottle was the most thing that we were collecting. It was the most thing that was speaking to me. I ignored it for kind of three years uh, in the uh, coastal line. I, I like, there was this message, but I was like, do I want to be more crazier? Do I want people to put more stigma on me now? Do I want to make a plastic bottle a sellable product? How? It's dirty, it's been thrown away. People that are not going to be much crazier and buy it back. Until the day I was taken um, to African Image by a girl called Monique Fagan, and he said, uh, Yandi, your story, it's what going to sell. It's, it's what tourists want. Uh, I'm taking two to one of my outlets, African Image. The Saturday came and then we went there and I was shivering with nerves. I, I, it, I think it was like six years now I've been in Cape Town. I've never been, my biggest town was Musenberg of Cape Town. My CBD was Musenberg. So now I'm, I'm being taken to Cape Town and I'm like, huh? So because of nerves, I didn't even notice low self-esteem. I, I had zero confidence in terms of like, what am I going to say to the shop owner? So we arrived there, two girls. The other girl is strong in Africans and I've got three English. You know, when you grow up in, in, in Eastern Cape and they teach you everything in Corsa, even English is being taught in Corsa in Eastern Cape. So I've got that kind of English. So I arrived in African image, shivering with nerves. And we're like arguing who's going to speak first. And then we look at each other by like side of the eyes and like we're busy arguing and arguing until these two girls turn back to us. And they say, Tracy, who's the shop? I said, Yandi, um, I want to see you. I had so much about you. I'm like, so much about us, this girl. Like, I, I want to see what you, so we went to the big bag full of junk turned into craft on the same time. And then we took one product because I don't want to be embarrassed. At the same time, Tandy one don't want to be embarrassed. So we must hold these dirty things both at the same time. So we took this curtain 
that is like kind of wrinkled and tangled around the plastic and we're trying to take it very quietly so that people don't see because the shop is full of like clients browsing so saturday summer morning it's full of tourists i don't even hear the africans that i was thinking that people of cape town are speaking um, um it's strange languages and um yeah so now we take the curtains and then the curtain because it's tangled and it's doll's legs doll's head plastic bottles I, I'm telling you, it made that noise because it's got everything that we're picking up from the beach. It's made out of that. So it made its noise anyway. And then all the clients turned back to us and they're like, guys, this is colorful. This is beautiful. This is so clever. I'm like, clever? And how much? And I'm like, my confidence started. And I'm not responding, but you, you know the spark, right? I'm, I'm like, yes. These are the ones that are crazy, not us. They're going to buy their junk back from us. So like we started that day to believe that whatever that's surrounding you, it has got a reason. And whatever that speaks to you from the environment has got the reason. Because if I had ignored it, continued, I could never ever went to all these doors that have, I've been in Australia, guys, I've been in Paris, I've been in, in Netherlands, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, there was a guy in Holland uh, who called and then wanted me to make a documentary. I was in that state where I didn't know what is the documentary. I'm like, say, yes, we do make crafts, but we don't make documentaries yet. <laughs> <laughs> So the documentary that the, the Holland guys wanted me opened, I made so many documentaries um, I, I, and <laughs> until I, I found myself that I, I've got the interest or my passion is to be working with people and because of the colorful, colorful um, plastic bottles, lids and so on, um, I will always find myself surrounded by children um, and I think they were thinking twice. And my love for children started then. I've, I've been working with um, so Sebenza Youth Group, and that led to Massive Creative Hub that has partnered uh, with the Norwich Child Programs, uh, the Faculty of Agro Science in Stellenbosch. I think that was uh, September 2020 last year. And I was asked to lead uh, workshops for or like the, the research program. I was like, Scott, do you know? So I got, yes, Yandi, yeah. Like, but. I took it on, guys, I took it on. <laughs> I took it on and after uh, we have uh, done four workshops, we gave birth to a group of young people, if they can stand, uh, uh, Norris Child Ambassadors from our community. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we use our stories to advocate for change in, in my community. I work very much with young people that are going to be taking on all these issues that you were talking and sharing today. Um, I, I think we have uh, learned a lot today. Uh, we, we're saying that um, this issue is supposed to be an equality issue, but um, recently our country was affected by, by COVID and it was displayed 110% that the communities that are affected by COVID. Okay. <laughs> Over to you then, Melvin. This um, presentation is extremely interesting and we will have another five minutes of uh, particularly around the uh, uh, child, uh, the, the champions work but at this point i need to say thank you and bid uh um uh farewell for uh to our online audience um so thank you to those who are online um we in felt your participation we will probably get some of your questions and we'll find a way of continuing our engagement